Camp Sumter, more commonly known as Andersonville, was a Confederate-run prisoner of war camp built to house Union soldiers during the Civil War. Oh, and it was also a hellhole. Thanks to rampant disease, overcrowding, and exposure to the elements, 13,000 men died within its brief 14 months of existence. At its worst, well over 130 Union prisoners died every day. Today we're going to find out what it was like to be one of those Union prisoners at Camp Sumter. But before we get started, take a second to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know what weird historical phenomenon, person, or event you'd like us to cover next. Now we go to Macon County, Georgia in the mid-1860s. You have to remember, the Confederacy could barely take care of their own soldiers, so it was no surprise that they had little provisions or care for their Union prisoners. Many of these Union soldiers wore rags or nothing at all. Sometimes, due to the elements, they were robbed by their own rogue comrades for their clothes. Union Private Prescott Tracy, an Andersonville prisoner, gave harrowing first-hand testimony on August 16, 1864, of his time captured. The clothing of the men was miserable in the extreme. Very few had shoes of any kind. Not 2,000 had coats and pants, and those were latecomers. More than one half were indecently exposed, and many were naked. These prisoners had no protection from the elements either, as Private Tracy continued. Our only shelter from the sun and rain and night dews was what we could make by stretching over us our coats of scraps of blankets, which a few had, but generally there was no attempt by day or night to protect ourselves. Escaping from Andersonville was a routine pastime among the prisoners, but the men who tried were rarely successful, and if they did escape, the elements usually killed them. But that didn't stop a large segment of inmates from forming small groups that would constantly dig tunnels under the fort's walls to freedom. POWs dug at night and carried away the fresh dirt in their pockets, letting it fall as they walked the camp during the day, a la Andy Dufresne in Shawshank while sick inmates lay over the holes during the daytime so Confederate guards wouldn't discover their schemes. The exits of these tunnels would end up towards the nearby forests, approximately 50 feet from the walls. Unfortunately for the POWs, even if they escaped Andersonville through a tunnel, they were too weak to make a legitimate run for it. When these prisoners were caught, they were either denied rations, chain gang, or shot. Some prisoners escaped by playing dead. Because so many men died every day, it was easy for an inmate to lay down with a bunch of corpses and then get carried out to a row of bodies outside the walls and await their mass burial. As soon as night fell, the men would get up and run. Almost immediately after it accepted their first prisoners, a dozen or so Union prisoners tied their clothes together to scale Andersonville's 15-foot-tall stockade. Confederate soldiers caught them, which then inspired the deadline. The deadline was a simple stake and wire fence which lined the inner walls of Andersonville, and its function was simple. It acted as a warning track, and it kept Union prisoners away from the prison stockade. Prisoners knew that if they touched the deadline fence, much less attempt to cross it, the Confederate soldiers, who were stationed atop the stockade, were ordered to shoot to kill. Enlisted Union soldier John Levi Mayle described the deadline. It consisted of a narrow strip of board nailed to a row of stakes, about four feet high. Shoot any prisoner who touches the deadline, was the standing order to the guards. A sick prisoner inadvertently placing his hands on the deadline for support, or anyone touching it with suicidal intent, would be instantly shot at, the scattering balls usually striking other than the one aimed at. Food was nearly non-existent at Andersonville, and when the Union prisoners did receive rations, it was usually rotten and barely fit for human consumption. Most of the men ate cornbread made from ground corn cobs and four tablespoons of rice per week. When they were lucky enough to receive meat, it was usually condemned pork, offensive in appearance and smell. Private Prescott Tracy went on to describe the Confederates dumping rations onto the ground at 4 p.m., feeding time. It was the custom to consume the whole ration at once, rather than save any for the next day. The distribution being often unequal, some would lose the rations altogether. But the lack of rations began even before these POWs reached Andersonville. Tracy stated that on the five-day march to the prison camp, Union troops barely ate. The sum of their rations for the five days was 13 crackers.
The only source of water the Andersonville prisoners had was a man-made channel that trickled through the middle of the camp. The water came from a nearby creek, which also served as the camp's latrine, and it was filled at all times with urine and fecal matter from the inmates. The Confederate guards didn't help as it was reported that they also contaminated the water on purpose. Private Tracy's testimony reported that the guards frequently dumped a large amount of the vilest material into the stream. The stream was the only source of drinking and cooking water for the POWs at the camp. Unfortunately, it also kept them sick for the entirety of their time there. Besides polluting the prisoners' only source of clean water, Confederate guards inflicted cruel and unusual punishment on their Union prisoners. For example, when the inmates got caught stealing, and there was a lot of stealing amongst POWs, they'd be either put in the stocks or they were forced to wear a ball and chain. And if a sick prisoner was missing at the daily roll call, inmates might be deprived of the ration. One Union prisoner, John L. Ransom, a quartermaster of Company A, 9th Michigan Volunteer Cavalry, kept a diary during his time at Andersonville. In one horrific scene, he wrote about witnessing Confederate guards shoot a sick POW. Ransom recalls watching a feverish, half-dressed POW deliberately walking to the deadline, where the guard fired, sending a ball through his brain, and the poor fellow fell in the ditch. Ransom wrote, perhaps he is better off, and a much easier death than to die of disease, as he undoubtedly would in a few days longer. Basically, a self-imposed death by firing squad, and this method wasn't uncommon. As bad as Andersonville's conditions were, its medical facilities were worse, and attempting to get first aid almost ensured one's excruciating death. Between February 25th and May 9th, 1864, a total of 4,588 patients visited the prison hospital. 1,026 of those perished. Private Tracy worked as a clerk in the Andersonville hospital. He reported, I've seen 150 bodies waiting passage to the dead house to be buried with those who died in hospital. The average of deaths through the earlier months was 30 a day. At the time I left, the average was over 130, and one day the record showed 146. Because over 100 Union men were dying every day, the Confederacy was having a difficult time dealing with the dead. Eventually, the prisoners were forced to dig long, shallow pits in order to bury their own. The POWs would then lay their fallen comrades side by side, dozens of men at a time, and cover them with fresh dirt and planks of wood. No coffins, no ceremony, nothing. Private Tracy touches on the mass graves during his arrival to Andersonville. On entering the stockade prison, we found it crowded with 28,000 of our fellow soldiers. By crowded, I mean that it was difficult to move in any direction without jostling and being jostled. Statistically speaking, the longer you were within Andersonville's walls, the greater your chances were of dying, but the Confederates did offer their prisoners an out, with a catch. The Confederate Army offered freedom and money for any Union soldier who took an oath of allegiance to the Confederacy. A tempting offer, for sure. Picture it. Living in feces, no clothes, no food, disease and death everywhere. And to escape it all and walk away with money in your pocket? It was a no-brainer. But Union soldiers were a different breed. In one of Private Tracy's pieces of testimony, he reported that none of his fellow Union men took the offer. It would have been so easy for these soldiers to fake the Confederacy's allegiance oath, walk away free men, and return back to the Union, but their honor and loyalty to the United States knew no breaking point. As the Civil War came to an end, news and photographs of the atrocities at Andersonville started spreading, and it horrified Northerners. After meeting with recently released POWs, Walt Whitman wrote, There are deeds, crimes that may be forgiven, but this is not among them. Much of the blame fell on Henry Wurz, the Confederate captain at Andersonville, and perhaps the second most hated person in America, after John Wilkes Booth. Two days before the Civil War ended, Wurz was detained, and soon after put on trial for war crimes he committed during his tenure as the man in charge of the Union's prisoners. More than 100 witnesses testified in the trial. Wurz was blamed for the loss of over 13,000 Union men and received a sentence of capital punishment. On November 10, 1865, at the old Capitol Prison in Washington, D.C., Wurz met his end underneath the gallows. Just before his hanging, Wurz told the officer overseeing the job, I know what orders are, Major. I am being hanged for obeying them. 
Decades later, some Southerners felt that Wurz got a raw deal. After all, he said he was just following orders. So in 1908, the United Daughters of the Confederacy built a monument honoring Wurz about a mile away from the prison camp to rescue his name from the stigma attached to it by embittered prejudice. It is one of the few Confederate monuments that still stands today. We want to know what you think. Could history repeat itself, and could America ever see another Camp Sumter? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.